feedback loops. Um, but it is good to have you here. Welcome to Cornerstone. And um, are you excited about the weather? I am. My goodness, I have enjoyed it. We had a good weekend. And I uh, hope you are enjoying it as well. Um, as we get ready for a time of worship, a few announcements to make. Um, if you have your bulletins, be sure to read them uh, more completely. I won't go through everything. There is a foundation of prayer meeting tonight. Um, or is there not? I know Ron is out of town. So, is someone else leading that? Or Okay, then apparently they're not meeting. Is that right? Okay. Um, so, Ron's out of town, so that is not meeting. Just wanted to clarify that. Um, Coming up tomorrow, Monday night, is Men's Bible Study, and we've got, we want to welcome and invite all of you guys to come to that. We'll be meeting here at church. Um, Perry and Dan and James are organizing it, and uh, it should be a good time. They're going to be using some of the speakers and sessions from the No Regrets Men's Conference, and even if you were at them, still encourage you to come to get a little more time of, of reflecting on those and interacting about them. Uh, also then, Tuesday night is our annual business meeting, and uh, please take note of that. It's at 7 p.m., and uh, there is one recommendation, formal recommendation, that we are going to vote on, and the council and trustees recommend that 50 chairs be ordered to replace the pews in the overflow uh, at the cost of $1,899. The money will come from the Barrett State to be voted on at the annual meeting on Tuesday, February 21, at 7 p.m. And so it's just those pews. Uh, we will also invite a time of discussion of, of different options in working through uh, the space limitations in the youth room. And so please come uh, ready to discuss that as well. Uh, but that the vote is just for um, changing some things in the back uh, to better accommodate different things like group, small groups that would meet Sunday school possibly, uh, issues like funeral visitations, we often use that area, and it would be nice to have that be a flexible multi-use purpose. Um, other announcements, there's an upcoming women's conference that Alliance is hosting, so take note of that, ladies, on the back, and uh, be sure to register for that as well. Um, before we go on and uh, spend some time in prayer, um, one of the things I want to just do is take a moment and pass on a couple of prayer requests. Um, two in particular. One is last night around 7 p.m., Ray Willard did pass away. Um, he had been dealing with retaining fluid and kidney failure, and the two of those together really took him down pretty fast over the last three or four days. And uh, so he did go home to be with the Lord last night. And uh, we wanted to pass that on. Some of you may have got that in the email or the prayer chain, but because it happened so late, many of you may not have heard that. Uh, so be in prayer for Edie and for the family. Uh, one thing that was very special was that all the kids were able to be there, and Edie was able to be there, several of the grandkids, when he passed away. Annette drove up from St. Louis and got there about 15 minutes before he died, but was able to talk to him. Uh, he could understand her. Tears were running down his cheeks, and they got to say goodbye. Uh, just a, just really a beautiful, special time for the family. And uh, it's just a gift from the Lord that, I mean, I think of had he died a half hour before she got there, it just would have made it more difficult. But it was just fun to see them enjoy that time together in the family and um, get to be there. Um, and I was there, I think, within 10 minutes after he passed away, and so it was, it was good. Um, it was a good part. Them to go through, but pray for them uh, as they go through the funeral preparations over the next few days. Um, also, Dr. Mike James, uh, MLC administrator, they're part of our church family, but his mother also passed away earlier this week on, um, that was Monday or Tuesday, but uh, earlier this week. And they will be leaving on Tuesday to go to California for that funeral, and so be praying for their family as well, and any encouragement uh, to them uh, would also be appreciated. But two significant events and families have been in our church this week. Um, but both of them were ready to go home and be with the Lord. And so that makes it um, a bit easier as well. Uh, some other prayer requests and praise items. Uh, an update from Bob and Carol Marsh is sitting on the, uh, in the back um, under the bulletin board. Uh, they're going to be preparing for a time of sabbatical. So just as they um, hand off the ministry, that it will continue to go well. Pray for them. And they've got a few big ministry things coming up. Um, 
Pablo and Judy also gave an update. Pablo's mother continues to recover, and so that's good. She's back home and on oxygen. Uh, Pablo had a cousin's son who passed away, um, but, but it's one of the cousins that is a believer within their family. It's an opportunity just for them to um, gather as a family. He thought even as many as 130 people might be there on Saturday. Um, and, and she was asking him, will you share? Um, and then um, just as they continue to work with churches, church leaders, um, there's been a particular resource of uh, really God using it to challenge and encourage the, some of the church leaders there and through uh, Pablo's discipleship ministry. So continue to pray for that. Um, we also had there to share. Our youth went yeah, over the last two days to Omaha. And um, I want you guys to be thinking, is there something you'd want to share um, to encourage us from what the Lord has been challenging or something that's stuck in your mind in your trip? Um, if you'd be willing to stand up and do that, um, I would invite you to do so now. But uh, it was fun to hear even my own daughter sharing a bit. And I don't know, Summer, do you want to even say just... I know you told the story that took about 15 minutes, but could you just <laughs> give us the 20 second summary of why did that story stick to your mind? Yeah, so they did like a drama one of the nights, and um, it, 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 it just really opened, opened my eyes and I'm sure a lot of the other youth's eyes of, like, just if you're walking down the street, like, are they saved? Are they a Christian? Like, you never know. Every second research shows that someone dies, and it's just like, where the person who just died, where, where they say it's like, it's, it's just something that it makes you wonder. Right, there really is an urgency <laughs> of sharing the good news, because if we don't, uh, people's eternities and lives are at stake, and uh, thanks for sharing that. Just what stuck in your mind if you went, any of you youth? Uh, did something stick out, or even the sponsors, did something stick out um, through your time there? Let's spend some time in prayer. 
Uh, dear Lord, we do thank you and praise you for the work you're doing in each of our lives. And that, and that Lord, it is important, it is urgent that, that we do uh, hear and respond to that good news. And not just that we hear and respond, but Lord, how will others hear unless someone uh, proclaims to them that good news? And how will they proclaim unless we're sent? And so, Lord, may we as a church continue to be sending um, and equipping and inspiring each one of us, every member of this church, to share Christ in a loving way at every opportunity, Lord, because the opportunities sometimes are passing right by us on the sidewalk, and we don't even see them. So open our eyes, open our hearts. Uh, Lord, give us a compassion that sees the need in the people around us, and the greatest need of all is that they know you, and is willing then to step in and to help meet that need. And Lord, give us wisdom in how we do that best, because sometimes uh, we want to push, and sometimes we need to step back, but, but every time it's, it's depending on your spirit to work and, and initiating at the level and the degree that, that, um, that you are leading us to, and I pray that we will do that effectively. Lord, I pray for Stacy. I pray for each of our college students, uh, and that you would uh, continue to, to build within them, equipping them to, to live their lives in truth. Um, Lord, it's so often we get out in uh, beyond the safety net and the comfort zones that we've grown up in that you really do a great work. And it's, it's exciting to see, uh, but it can also be challenging because our very foundations can be stretched and, and challenged and even shaken. But Lord, it's, it's through that uh, testing that our faith becomes so solid when, when it is built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ and the Word of God. And, and it's not just what my parents did, it's not just what my tradition has done, but it's what you have called us to and designed us for as, as human beings built in the image of God, created in the image of God, to love you and to walk with you, Lord, that, that it becomes a beautiful, beautiful work of art. And I pray that that will continue to grow with each of our college students and that through the testing and through the doubts and through the questions, um, they will come through um, as, as being tested and approved as silver is tested by fire. We pray for the uh, Ray Willard family, for Edie especially, that you'll just encourage and comfort them and each of the kids. Lord, thank you that they were able to be here and pray that through this, Lord, that they will continue to reflect upon Ray and the legacy he leaves, his faith in you. Uh, Lord, just his assurance that he was going to a better place and we thank you and praise you for that. We also pray um, for uh, Dr. James, for Mike, and for uh, Candace and each of the kids as they have said, had to say goodbye to a grandparent and a, for Mike, a parent, that you will draw them together as a family. Uh, Dr. James, for Mike, and for uh, Candace and each of the kids as they have said, had to say goodbye to a grandparent and a, for Mike, a parent, that you will draw them together as a family.
uh, greater you, Lord. And it's just this funny, this ironic thing that he did, man. The reality of our need for a Savior is our first song. Uh, that we are, we are the bearers of the good news. That his sacrifice was sufficient in man's sorrows. And that we live lives of worship in greater you, Lord. And so let that journey take your heart to the throne of the Father. And give him your best in the worship.
be molded and shaped by the power of the word. In Jesus' name. Is that Gideon Gray? 
Yeah, it sure is. We work with him now. He's our partner, and we never would have considered it had you not opened our minds. That's right. I mean, Gibbs turned into one of the top pastry chefs in the tri -Burros. That's really cool, you guys. Getting great. I'll be darned. Hey, Judy, I, I'd just like to say I'm sorry for the way I, I, I behaved in my youth. I had a lot of self-doubt, and it manifested itself in the form of unchecked rage and aggression. I was a major jerk. All oh, right, I was bad to hear about being a jerk. Anyhow, I, I brought you all these pies. Hey, kids, don't you run through that mini camp of all the time? Oh, that's good. Well, change, uh, he does, and... There, there's a change of heart, and we don't know the whole road to redemption. He goes on how he gets there, but it's just neat to see. And even through the movie, a few of those themes come out. But who was it at your high school class reunion? Could you ever imagine a change like that? Well, one of the things in Scripture that we read about, and we're going through the story of Joseph, and there's a bit of a detour to explain one of these life-transforming situations. And uh, because the way Genesis 37 ends is that uh, one or some of Jacob's brothers, and a couple of them are mentioned even by name, and one of them is Judah. And how Judah comes up with this plan, almost like it's too good to kill Joseph and put him out of his misery. Let's sell him as a slave so he has to live in his misery for the rest of, rest of his life. And so Judah comes up or has this idea to sell him as a slave. And, um, and off Joseph goes into Egypt. And, and what's amazing is, is if you skip over this chapter, and if you just read on in the story of Joseph, and you know, jo this is a spoiler alert for those of you who don't know the story, but I'm guessing y'all do, so we're going to spoil it. Um, but Joseph goes down, spends time in slavery in Potiphar's house, ends up getting falsely accused, thrown in jail, ends up, through being in jail, comes to know some people in the king's court, and interprets a dream for them. They go back to court a couple years later. The king has a dream. They invite Joseph. God gives him the interpretation. And uh, he's elevated to his second in command. The brothers come down to Egypt wanting grain. He gives them grain, but suspecting the worst. And he wants to find out, has they had a heart change? And so he sends them back with their money, and they say, well, we can't go back because we never paid for the first grain. And he suspects us to be Spies, and we're supposed to take our brother back, and we can't do that. Well, finally, they, they get so they get so um, impoverished, and at the end of the road, the only option is to go back and take their brother. And Joseph has a plot lined up where he's gonna he's gonna stage Benjamin as the guilty party. And it's interesting because as you go through the story, Judah is the one. I think Judah is the one that says. If anyone in our group has the money or has your um, your gods, your idols, your teraphim, I think, in his bag, he can be put to death. And it's Benjamin. And what happens at that point? Do they say, oh, good riddance of God, of our father's favorite son? No, what happens? What does Judah say at that point? Do you remember? Judah says, hey, Joseph. Or he doesn't say, he say Joseph. He says, hey, Pharaoh. Um, we cannot take my brother. It would kill my father. He's already lost one son. Take me in his place. What in the world would bring about a heart change like that? What would bring about a heart change like that? And if you don't read chapter 38, you don't know. And uh, someone asked me last week, are you going to skip over chapter 38? Because it's pretty dicey. And if you had a movie made out of this, it would not be one you'd want to take your kids to. But we aren't going to skip over it because it's important in understanding a huge change. And we're going to see exactly how significant that is. And so turn with me to Genesis 38, and we're going to try to go through this. I'm not going to go through every detail for a reason, but I want to at least highlight what takes place here so you can understand the struggle that's going on within Judah. And as you start reading in verse 38, now, so we're going back in time. Joseph was sold into slavery. They came back and tell their father... We found this coat covered in blood. Is it your son's? He says, yes. He surely has been devoured by wild animals. He mourns and grieves, and no one can comfort him, even though they try. And how does Judah take it? 
Well, here's what it says. It came about at that time that Judah departed from his brothers and visited a certain Adullamite whose name was Hira. And Judah saw a daughter there, a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he took her and went into her, and she conceived and bore a son and named him Ur, and she conceived again and bore a son and named him Onan, and she still bore another son and named him Shelah, and it was at Shezib that she bore him. Now Judah took a wife for Er, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. Uh, but in this, where does Judah, what happens to Judah? What does he do? At this time, what does Judah do? He leaves. He departs. He can't even live with his father anymore. Can you imagine looking your father in the face day after day, living in this morning? And I know. I lied to my grandma once. And it seemed like every time we were at her house, somehow that lie came up. Somehow. It was miserable. You can't live with yourself when you're living in lie and deceit. And so what did Judah do? He got out of there. He left. He couldn't live in that. And, and he tries to comfort himself. How? Women? Wine? The fun of life? Just wash away your sorrows and he finds a beautiful woman and he marries her. Well, maybe he marries her. It doesn't say that. He went into her anyway. Lived with her. And this is apart from normally, this is a family arrangement. When you carry on a family, the fathers so far have always been involved in, in passing down and saying, hey, we're going to find this, a, daughter, a wife for my son. And, and particularly in this, in this day, Abraham and Isaac made sure when they found a wife for their son, the son of the promise, it was not a Canaanite. Why? Because in that day, the, mixed day, the Canaanites worshipped foreign gods. And they were a part of their daily practices. We're going to see a little bit of that. But that's what happened in Shechem. They were having a religious party, a festival where they're drunk and they're having free, um, say the word, if you want me to, S E X. Because that was how they celebrated their religion. And it's like Judah gets sucked into this. And what common, what, what commonality do light have with darkness, Paul says? Don't be unequally yoked. Even in the New Testament, when you marry someone who worships a different God and goes a direction, different direction in life than you, it affects you and influences you and pulls you away. And that's what Judah enters into. And what's significant is because he is the son of the promise. He tries to escape the pain of his mistakes, the guilt of Joseph's abduction, and runs off. And he chooses to go outside of the covenant community and live his own life. The biggest concern, God's instructions, were ignored, were passed up, were overlooked, and he didn't want to live as a covenant member of God's chosen people. He was off on his own. Don't take God's design and, and express desires lightly. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. And, and the same warnings come to us. It's a big deal. Even the sons of Judah now face the consequences of his actions and ultimately face God's judgment because they are now brought up in an evil culture. And they are, they embody this evil. And God judges them for that. And as you read now in verse 6 and 7, so Judah takes a wife for his firstborn. Her name was Tamar. Now, it doesn't say that Tamar is a Canaanite. So maybe Judah learned his lesson. Maybe he went outside of the Canaanite clan, but we, it's not said for sure. Tamar um, means uh, date palm, which is like a palm tree, so if it oftentimes name reflects character, that she's probably like a slender and a beautiful woman, and you'll see this later on and how it's lived out. But he takes a son, a wife for his son, and it says that his firstborn heir was evil in the sight of the Lord. Now that's unfortunate. But here is what's even more significant, is what is the result of that? So the Lord took his life. Now one of the questions that came to me is, goodness God, why do you kind of pick on, why do you pick on him? Like, there's a lot of people who are evil inside the Lord, but you don't just strike him down. Why him? Well, I'm going to say because he's a member of a covenant community. He's called to live according to a standard as a member of, of, of the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, and it's, it's saying, Judah, if you are going to completely ignore this, there's going to be consequences that you're going to face for your actions. 
They face God's judgment because of their evil. And the warning comes to fruition. What's interesting, though, is that this warning, uh, the, the, this, this neglecting community and covenant responsibility isn't just Ur who, who struggles with it. Now his brother Onan is told, go into your brother's wife and perform your duty as a brother-in-law to her and raise up offspring for your brother. Um, in my side notes, Deuteronomy 25.5 is there, which happens later, but in the law, this was a part of the Old Testament law. This was commanded when a brother dies without any offspring. It's the brother's responsibility to have an offspring for him, not considered his own son, but for him in his name to carry on the family. Um, it, you know, they didn't have life insurance policies in those days. Um, they depended on family to care for them. And this was, in a way, a, a way of continuing on that family line and the line of blessing. This was not necessarily something he was doing um, out of sorts, but as part of God's plan. And Onan knew the offspring would not be his, so he went into his brother's wife. And um, purposely, intentionally, does not bring up offspring for her. And God sees this as a very, uh, his act is one of, of rebellion to God's plan. And as again, why is this so important? Because this Judah is the chosen seed now through which the Messiah would come. So this isn't just an ordinary Joe on the side of the road. This is someone who's entered into this covenant responsibility, maybe not even by choice, but yet it's been passed on to him, and he is specifically ignoring, undermining, going against God's plan. And he too faces judgment and dies. God takes his life. It's interesting. God knows what goes on even in the secret bedrooms of our life. Even the things that happen behind closed doors. God knows our hearts. He knows our intents. He knows that that was an intentional, purposeful, uh, going around God's plan. He knows that. Jesus warned the Pharisees as they stood before him in their minds thinking thoughts of judgment. Jesus said, why are you thinking those thoughts? In Luke chapter 2, as he healed someone, they said, he's doing this on the Sabbath. They thought that. And he, can, he knows our thoughts. He examines our thoughts and our hearts, even from afar, Psalm 139 says. So it says, search our hearts, know our thoughts, cleanse us and purify us. Now the responsibility falls again on Judah to give his next son. And what happens? Well, Judah sees both of his sons have died, and he, he asks Tamar to remain a widow in her father's house. In other words, I'm not taking responsibility for you. This must be your fault. You go back to your father's house. This was an ultimate um, criticism of her because he was responsible. When, you, when your son takes a wife, she's a part of your family. You care for her as your own, just like Ruth did with Naomi. That was Naomi. She was a part of that family now. He sends her away. And now she's been, um, in, in a way, I hope she's been defiled. She has this rep reputation. I mean, he's, he's putting um, a great burden, even a curse on her by doing this. And he's afraid to give his youngest son to her because he's afraid, too, that she may die. He's blaming her for it, not his own son. He's not willing to see what's going on before his own eyes. After a considerable time, Shua's daughter, the wife of Judah, also dies. And when the time of mourning was ended, um, so now Judah's own wife dies. It doesn't say that this is God's judgment, but you begin to wonder. God has a plan. He's carrying it out. If Judah is going to choose to follow God's way, God's going God's to create circumstances whereby which he can carry out his will. And again, what's his will? What's at stake here? <coughs> Is it just an ordinary judgment? This is the very line of the Messiah that is at stake. And God is going to carry out his plan. And so Judah's wife dies. After the time of mourning is over, his character begins to reveal itself once again. What does he do? 
he went up to the sheep shears at Timnah, and he and his friend, Hira the Yulamite, were heading there. Why the sheep shears? It was a time of celebration and feasting, kind of one of those crossover religious pagan celebrations. Guess what happens? Not good stuff. Here he's on his way, and Tamar is told, hey, your father in law is going there, and so she has a plan. So she takes off her widow's garments, covers herself with a veil, wraps herself, and sits in the gateway. Why? Well, for those of you who know what she's doing, she's intentionally um, presenting herself to the men who pass by, knowing the character of one of those men who is coming. And his character comes out, he passes by, and um, Judah sees her. He thought she was a harlot. So he turns aside by the road to her and says, Here now, let me come into you. He, she doesn't even have to proposition him. She just sits there and he does it all. And, and what's amazing is how not only is, is our responsibility in God's covenant family not to be taken lightly, but just to see how Judah's own folly, his own foolish choices begin to expose where his heart is at. And it's not free. And, and the scriptures are almost too honest with this. Because it makes us uncomfortable, but it's very real. But this is where the very people and children of God were at. But God works even through our most foolish decisions for his glory. Aren't you glad for that? Aren't you glad for that, that this isn't the end of the story? And so he goes into her, and she conceives, and, and well, first she says, well, what will you give me as, as payment? And he says, well, I'll give you a young goat. And she says, okay, but I don't have it now. Well, give me something in the meantime. And this is where his folly just continues to expose itself. So what's he give her? Well, his, his cord and his seal and his staff. These are like his identification papers. Like, here, take my driver's license, my passport, and... Uh, you know, in my wallet. Why would you give him that or give her that? Goodness sake, he's probably drunk already. Likely. Why else would he do that? The first person he meets on his way to a party, he's already making horrible decisions. I mean, if you want to talk about the epitome of folly, this is it. The patriarch of our faith. She's impregnated three months later. It's noticeable. She's not hiding it. And whose responsibility is it to deal with her? Not her family's. Again, she's under the responsibility of Judah. So they call him up. What should we do? And what does he say? Read it in verse 24. Then Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. What do you think he's thinking? Finally, she's going to get what she deserves, Right? Two of my sons have already died at her hands. Now look at what she's doing. She's going to get it. While she was being brought out, she sent to him. This is the while she's being brought out. Can you imagine the drama? I mean, in that day, this is like, this is like the, the talk of the town. Today's the day. There's probably a large gathering of people waiting to see what's going to happen. And... Um, as she's being brought out, she sends this to her father-in-law, saying, I'm with child by the man to whom these belong. Examine and see whose signet ring and cords and staff are these. And Judah recognizes them. They are his. And he now has a choice. One of the things that I'm surprised by, she took a huge risk in this. Now, is she right in doing it? I don't know if the Bible is condoning her methods, because uh, in many ways, she is at fault for not following the, the, even the traditions of, of, of what to do in light of a kinsman redeemer. And you read in Deuteronomy 25, and it says, if they won't fulfill their duty, you invite them into the public square, and you, and you say, this is your duty, and if they refuse to do it, you take off, what is it, a shoe, and you slap them in the face, and you say, so, so the shame of God, I'm paraphrasing, the shame of God be on you for failing your duty. She, she could have gone through a legal process of, of accusing him and of confronting him, which would have brought shame on him. 
she does it this way, which is a risk, because he could have said, you stole these. He could have said, I didn't give these to you. How did you get these? And so she took a risk, not doing it the right way. Not, and you know what? Sometimes when we're confronted by our own sin, is it because everything the other person done has been done perfect? They were completely in the right, and I was wholly in the wrong, and now they're confronting me with my sin. Is that how it always works? Never. It never works that way. When we're confronted with our sin, it's almost always that they were at fault too. The question now that is left on our shoulders is, am I going to deal with my part of the problem? Am I going to deal with my part of the problem? And how does Judah respond? I think here's what happens, and this response is going to be the key phrase in this whole chapter. Because how does he respond? How does he now look at Tamer? Totally different life. His whole perspective has changed. His heart has changed. He once saw her as the problem. Now who is the problem? He says, surely she is more righteous than I. His whole perspective changed. He now sees himself as the problem. He understands that he is the one at fault because he did not Allow her the right responsibility. I think even greater than that, I think he began to see his failure to carry out his responsibility before God. <coughs> what was that? To be the, the, the lineage bearer of the very Messiah himself. How do you know he began to see that? Because here's what happens after this. He says, she is more righteous than I, for I did not give her my son, but he did not have relations with her again. It's, it's likely that he was willing to fulfill his role, not to his advantage, but to her good. To care for her as a daughter-in-law, not treat her as a concubine. It came about at the time she was giving birth that, behold, there were twins in her womb. More of it took place while she was giving birth. One put out a hand. The midwife took it back and tied it this one came out first. Drew back his hand, and then the brother came out, and she said, what a breach you've made for yourself. So his name was Purus. After his brother came out, who had to start with thread in his hand, his name was Zara. And um, But what you see here is there's a heart change. He begins to fulfill his responsibility. And, and through this, and because not only did he fulfill his responsibility to her, to Tamar, do you know what else happened? What else happened before because how long did that take? I mean, for him to get married, have kids, and then his kids get married, how long do you think that took? It's, it's probably about 20 years. Do you know how long Joseph was down in Egypt as a slave and in prison? Well, he went down at age 17, and then it says he became, he came into power at age 30. How long is that? 13 years. And how long was the, the feasting? Seven years. So... 13 plus 7 is 20 years. Then came the famine. And after the famine had hit hard, maybe a couple of years, his brothers came. So, I mean, it's likely been 22 years. And what's interesting is this corresponding time frame is I think God did his work just in the nick of time. I mean, for him to have kids, them grow up, him still living apart from his family, in rebellion. His kids grow up, his, they get married, they die. He's finally faced with dealing with this problem. And what happens? Where, where is he when he comes to Egypt? He's with his brothers. He's not living out on his own. He's been reunited with his family. When he comes back the second time, what is his relationship with his family like? It's good. It is good. How do you know that? Because he's defending his brother Benjamin. He is standing up for him. He's caring for his father. He loves him. He has a heart change. And it took this. As ugly and as despicable as it was, God uses sometimes our most foolish decisions and, and things in life to help us see our own need for him. And to say, God, I need you. 
and to come to him in his grace, in his forgiveness, in his mercy, and allow that to restore us. And what's so amazing is when he has his kids, that Perez, I think it's Perez, becomes the line of the Messiah. He makes the breach. Even though the other one's coming out, Perez came out first. And uh, he becomes, and, and you see so often with Jacob and Esau, the younger will serve the older. With, with Jacob blessing Joseph's two sons, he, he, he you'll see that. Yeah. But there's this theme that comes out of God's at work. God's at work, even in our mess. When we're willing to come, and what was the key there for Judah? You're more righteous than I. He came with a heart of repentance. Not focused on, what have you done? But focused on, oh my, what have I done? And as he came with a heart of repentance, he found the healing and the forgiveness and the grace that he could then extend to his brothers, that he could then extend to his father, that he could then extend to reshape God uses our repentant heart to reshape our future, allowing the truth to expose our guilt and to deal with it. And what's so amazing is not only does the truth expose his guilt, where does that truth end up? How do you know about it today? It ends up in the very pages of Scripture. Why? Why? I mean, do you want your worst moments but at what point is that our testimony? As we share, God, I messed up. And I want my kids and I want my family and I want them to see that it's not about me. It's about the very grace of God as I'm willing to surrender to his plan and go his way because if I try to do it my way, guess what it's going to end up? And God is willing to forgive and reconcile and bring about Good things. Even to the point of Judah is the one. As Joseph, uh, Jacob dies and blesses his sons, do you know what he says of Levi and Simeon? He remembers. He remembers their anger and their fury and, and, the, and, the, and what they did at Shechem. But when he thinks of Judah, what does he remember? And why? I think it's because he had a repentant heart. And the others, his blessings flow. Judah as he blesses him. Great things are foretold of Judah even though he was as much of a mess as any of them. God as he surrendered. Dear Lord, we thank you. Thank you that you don't leave us in our mess. And that sometimes you even use our mess to draw us back to you in a more powerful way than we could ever imagine, Lord, and to develop within us a conviction that we will go to prison for our brother for because we've learned that sending our brother into captivity wasn't the answer. We've learned that the mess we've made of our lives isn't worth it. We've learned that you call us to a way. A way of walking with you, of walking with others that cares for them rather than uses and abuses them. A way that, that you transform our lives so that your blessing can flow, and that through us being blessed, Lord, it doesn't end with us because it's not about us. It ends with the whole world being blessed, just as you promised me, Lord. Thank you. That is your work, and the road to redemption may be hard. But Lord, as we each travel that road, may we be willing to confess our own sins, to turn from them, and to, and to allow you to be glorified even in the worst moments of our life, because it is about you. Thank you.